Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining me for today's event, Open Energy Lessons from Open Banking. And I'm delighted to be joined by Stephen Steer, Head of Data at Ofgem, Paul Fitton, Head of Information Systems at Northern Power Grid, and Johnny Haggerty, Head of Open Banking Technology at NatWest. I'm also joined by my colleague, Peter Hughes, Principal Consultant at Scott Logic, who will be facilitating the panel discussion. Now, if you have a question for the panel, do get them into the Q&A box as we go along, and we'll take as many as we can at the end. And at the end of the webinar, we will ask you to complete a very short survey, but I'll give you a bit more information about that a bit later on. So without further ado, let me pass you over to Peter. Thank you very much, Claire, and welcome to everybody watching the event. Uh, one of the main areas of work and personal interest that I have here at Scott Logic is the energy transition and the target of net zero and why open energy is such a critical part of that future. The global energy transition is well underway, as, as I'm sure everybody reads in the press every day, and now requires the UK power sector to digitalize and leverage existing and new data to offer new services which will support the route forward to net zero. Today, we are discussing how the power sector can transition to open energy and learn from other regulated sectors, such as finance, who have already implemented open banking to move faster, to address challenges earlier, and deliver greater value to all stakeholders. Just how far reaching will the outcomes of open energy be, not just in the energy sector, but to the wider economy. With our guests today, we'll explore this topic from three angles. Firstly, we're going to look at the big picture and set the context to give everybody a point of reference. Secondly, we'll discuss how we are prepare, preparing for open energy. And thirdly, how will we actually go about the transition? And once we get towards the end of the session with about 10 minutes to spare, I'll be passing back to Claire to manage the questions and answers. So I'd like to come to Stephen first. Um, and Stephen, if you could give a broad introduction of yourself uh, for the benefit of our uh, participants. Uh, and I'd like to put the first question to you if I could, once you've introduced yourself, Stephen. And the, my question is this, Ofgem sees open energy as an important step in the energy transition and meeting eventually the net zero targets. What does Ofgem hope the outcome will be from implementing open energy, not just for the network companies, the power distribution companies, but for the wider economy? Stephen. Hi, thanks, Peter. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, lovely to be here. Uh, an introduction on me. So I'm Stephen Steer. I'm currently working at Ofgem, but, but I'm a, actually by background a, a nuclear physicist and I worked in academia and across commercial markets as well, both in energy and the healthcare sector. Um, but yes, I've been at the regulator for about five years now. Um, and, and most of that time has been spent on this agenda, which has been brilliant and really gratifying. And it's really nice to see how far it's come, actually. If you, you, you draw comparison to the way the energy sector talked about data just a few years ago to the way it does today, um, there's already been tremendous uh, progress and, and change, which is really good for the direction of travel in the future, which is what you asked me about. So let's let's start talking about that. Uh, so there are, there are there really are some tremendous opportunities and benefits for for putting data to proper use and treating it like the asset that it is for society. Uh, I think one of the things, and you pointed to it in your question, which is really appreciated actually, that. Um, uh, assets don't just have one user or one beneficiary. So it's very, it's been very easy to think traditionally of the energy sector that we need to put the energy system to use for the benefit of energy consumers. And that is very important. And it, you know, it slots together with big picture challenges like obviously net zero, but also just improving the quality of energy services for people and making sure people are out of fuel poverty and these kinds of topics. But there are many applications for that asset and that really works in the data and digital space that you can reuse those assets many times over and, and you can build up a whole ecosystem of really wonderful products and services wrapped around those fundamental assets and it is quite a fundamental asset in the case of the energy system we've we've only got one for the country in anywhere you are you've only got access to one type of energy system for you 
And that makes it something that everybody needs to work with and share. And, and so by treating it as open, uh, it's the same way, I, I like the analogy of um, uh, the right to roam about throughout, through our, our national land over, it's, it's got the Scottish right to roam, because it's really important that our economy, our people are able to have the right to roam through our national energy system and take advantage of it and use it. And that really speaks to strong uh, cross sectoral opportunities about integrating the use of data uh, that other markets can take advantage of or to, to, or to join the markets together and use you know, to, to, to have, say, an overall infrastructure view of how data is taken advantage of or to give people at home a, you know, a joined up picture of all the different services that come into their property or to make sure that the transport sector, as it interlinks uh, with the energy sector as we move to an electric vehicle fleet, uh, are able to work together in harmony. And it's that, that, that harmony is really important. And the fact that we only have one is really precious. Um, it means we all need to work together on it. And that means in the first instance, just all having visibility and access to it to be able to start those new markets uh, rolling uh, for the prosperity of the country. Great. I, I really like that analogy, the right to roam. Um, if I can just come over now to Paul, um, and you are the person who actually is the landowner by the sounds of that analogy, Paul. <laughs> Paul, if you could just give us a little bit of introduction of your role within Northern Power Grid. Um, and I'd like to put the question to you, as, as Northern Power Grid prepares to implement open energy through your digitalization strategy, which has been published, um, what do you expect to be the opportunities and challenges ahead? And where do you expect to see the greatest value? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Peter. And, and yes, you're right. I suppose that I am the, the landowner. I'm proud to own the land that happens to be some of the, the prettiest, in my opinion. In, uh, in the UK. Um, so yeah, Paul Fitton, Head of Information Systems for Northern Power Grid. So we cover, uh, we're, we're the DNO, Distributed Network Operator for um, the Northeastern Yorkshire region. Um, I've been with Northern Power Grid for about three years now. Um, so, you know, joining at a, at a really, really interesting time as this agenda comes to the floor and, uh, you know, picking up on, on Stephen's point there around, you know, how, how that change and that that difference of of where the utility sector has been to where it's going to you know I, I feel as I've kind of been dropped in almost right at that point of transition so it, it's been a really interesting first three years uh, and certainly a, a lot more to come but yeah so but pre, prior to that uh, similar uh, Stephen as much as having kind of no connection to the utility sector uh, I came from a, 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 a very different but quite similar in terms of an asset heavy industry in the in the housing sector and um, prior to that working across some some various different uh, businesses before then but yeah so so to answer your question um yeah the, i guess the, the major opportunity for northern power grid is that we we can help shape that discussion in that direction of how our regions and stakeholders will support that move to net zero and the value um that that brings i think is is the opportunity for us to work with that wider um, community in doing so at the lowest possible cost. So, you know, our, our vision, if you like, is, is for our network to evolve into um, a, a trusted sort of neutral platform able to facilitate that uh, optimization of our region's energy systems, um, minimize the need for new infrastructure, make the best use of low carbon generation and minimize the need for expensive dedicated storage and high carbon generation. So all of which has that underpinning need for better data, better analysis, but, but equally for that data to be open to all. So embracing the, the open uh, angle is one that, that, that we recognize is, is absolutely critical, but is also a part of that challenge. Um, because let's be honest, it, it's not where we've come from. You know, it's not ingrained in our in in our psyche, in our uh, approach to to uh, data in general. You know, we're, uh, we're very much asset rich, and and therefore commit a lot of resource, time, and effort to managing those assets and having data rich um, facilities around those assets themselves. But getting digital right and getting that digitalization transition right will require changes, um, I suppose, to the way our, our business operates, the model in which it operates, but also, and I think this is probably the, the biggest aspect to our culture. Um, so, so we know we, we, we 
have a, a gap to cover there. We're getting to ground on on putting forward some sort of initial steps on that now. Um, and I think, uh, you know, um, taking this in an agile way, doing this in iterations is going to be the way to, to, to crack this. It, it isn't big bang. We're not going to get to a certain point and, and, you know, we'll have, we'll have done this, you know, open data is achieved. Um, I think this will be a continuation for many, many years to come. And for us now, it's about starting that journey. And, you know, I, I suppose that I really like the term, um, build it and they will come. And that, that's sort of the approach that we're taking. You know, we are engaging mm -hmm. with stakeholders right now who are showing that there is a need for some of this data. Mm -hmm. But the more we can tell, the more they can ask and, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that I, I suppose that's, that's, that's where we see the biggest opportunities in, in being okay. part of a much bigger community. In, in, in many ways, Paul, in many ways, Paul, I, I, I have the greatest sympathy for uh, the distribution companies like Northern Power Grid. There isn't, there isn't an, um, uh, um, you know, an off the shelf book that you can just pick up and read chapter one, how to, to get on with this. But what we can do is look at other sectors and other people who perhaps, yeah. perhaps had to deal with regulators. Um, so I'd like to just uh, uh, come to um, Johnny, our, our, our third guest. Um, and Johnny, if you can just give a little introduction um, of your background. And I, Johnny comes uh, very much to this, perhaps, uh, who may be able to see further into this than most of us, because of his experience. So I'd like to pose the question after your introduction there, Johnny. Um, you're part of NatWest and you were in a very similar position five or six years ago. How would you describe NatWest's journey as it went from perceiving open data in the open banking initiative from, from a regulatory compliance requirement to seeing it as much more than that, as, as an opportunity for NatWest. So, uh, Johnny. Yeah, sure. Thanks for uh, having me along, Peter. Um, <clears throat> I think you may have just given me a book idea, but I'm not sure if I could squeeze on to Paul's perfect shelves. Um, so, yeah, I'm Johnny. I run the API platform here at NatWest Group, one of the uh, big banks in the UK, as most people will know. Um, that really includes three things. Um, it includes the foundations um, for teams around the bank to build APIs on top of. So things where we can document them, places where we can deploy them, patterns that we can employ to, to get them out quicker, and things like sandbox environments for you know, consumers and the ecosystem to then use those uh, quickly and iterate and, and find value. I also um, you know, consult, help and build APIs across the bank, um, helping us go beyond what we call open banking. Um, we're probably a few uh, years in front of the, the energy sector in that, in that kind of example, I guess, given, given where we've come from. And then you know, why I'm here, so I lead the delivery of our open banking APIs uh, across the bank um, that we've delivered to market over the last few, few years as part of a, a kind of much a much broader ecosystem so i guess um you know the word i'd probably use to describe the last few years is, is whirlwind to some extent um you know it's not been to your point something where you you pick up the book at chapter one and you understand exactly how you're going to get from from where you are to where you need to be there's a lot of uh, kind of cyclic activity feedback kind of trial and error that we've had to go through to get to where we are um, I guess for, for people's information, um, open banking as a concept started five or six years ago, I guess, in the banking sector back in 2015. But, you know, it really wasn't until 2017 that it moved from first or second year um, way up into fifth. And I think um, like a lot, a lot of big companies, and I suspect the energy sector will really be no different here. You know, it takes a while for people to react to change uh, and to also really understand the potential that, that that change can bring, right? Um, we started from, from a stand and start, you know, we started in a fairly typical mindset, you know, we were a, a program, for want of a better word, of people that were assembled into a central place to go and deliver against this, this mandate. I think it's fair to say that the people, um, you know, at the centre of that program, program saw it much, much, as much more than that, you know, from day one. They saw it really as a, a platform and a capability that we could anchor, um, you know, innovation and future success from. 
But I think it's very fair to say that 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 wasn't true for people outside the team, right? I mean, they just saw it as another thing that they had to react to, another thing that they had to contribute some some milestone to, etc. Um, so to that point, you know, we had to work hard. We had to play, break a lot of um, delivery mindsets and incumbent behaviours. Shed a few tears along the way to get our first set of APIs out the door in 2018. And I think the bank as a whole has really kind of gone onwards and, and upwards from that point. Um, we've really grasped the, the opportunities the broader ecosystem has presented, not just externally in the, the external ecosystem, albeit, you know, I wouldn't separate the, the external ecosystem's value from the value that you can realise internally, but we've seen massive value internally as well. Um, you know, there's a real realisation and a reality that, that we as a bank aren't the, the origin of all great ideas. And frankly, even if we were the origin of all great ideas, we would never be able to, to build them all. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's great to be part of that ecosystem. And, and to that point, I guess, you know, what we've really realised is that, you know, in an ecosystem play, the success of the ecosystem is really based on the whole ecosystem growing. It's not based on one or two individual players or companies being wildly more successful than others. You know, as everyone grows, uh, the whole the whole ecosystem grows. Um, so a couple of points internally and externally, and then I'll, I'll play it back to open energy um, and we can move on to some questions, I guess. But we've onboarded, you know, a couple of hundred um, financial institutions now. So that's people that are delivering value um, for our joint customer set. Um, those companies fundamentally have a mission to improve our customers' lives and create great outcomes for them, which plays really nicely with the bank's broader ambitions of being both uh, purpose-led and, you know, to focus on the purpose of what we do as opposed to the, the pounds and pence and milestones, et cetera, et cetera, um, as well as being powered by partnerships. And I think the thing that's often missed with this, this opportunity is that internally, um, we've started to see real benefit as well. You know, a lot of the conversations that we have as technologists in the bank, they're centered around how do I connect to your platform to get this data? And that's an API based conversation, right? And only, you know, one, two, three years ago, that was a Gantt chart conversation. You know, it was about how do I get onto your backlog? How do I make myself more important than the other person? You know, how can I convince you that the, the thing that I want to do is more important than anyone else? You know, now we see people consuming data from teams around the bank without even speaking to them. You know, I've, I've seen several examples in the last few months where people have presented working propositions that are ready to go to customers that I never even knew they were building, right? And that's mm. that's a really pleasant surprise. And, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, really, you know, brings me to work every day. And then the last thing I'd say is, is that, you know, I really hope that as the, the energy sector reflects in, on the open banking space, you know, you can look at it and you can actually see the tangible reality it, it brings, right? I mean, what what you guys are doing in the open energy space, I, I don't think it's just an educated guess or a theory or a bet anymore. You can touch and feel something that's been on this journey that has proven success with it. Um, and, you know, it's something that will, will really move the sector forward, I think. Great. Good. I like the comment there powered by partnerships. And if we just move the conversation to looking at how we prepare for open energy, I, I think Stephen, the regulator, has to be the ultimate partner and the person who seeds this. And if you're accountable, Stephen, for forming the future of the power sector, how are you helping everybody to get up to the start line? Understanding Paul's earlier comment that, you know, we're just, that's not where we are at the moment. So you as the, the first partner of the power sector, as the regulator, Stephen, um, how are you helping these companies get up to the start lines for these open data aspirations? Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, I mean, if I can comment on the question a little bit first, but yes, I will, I will answer it. I think, so uh, I, I find it really helpful to draw parallels and analogy, and, and I feel the, the gravity of the undertaking of digitalizing the energy sector is, is, is at least in the same ballpark of complexity as when the when the physical energy system was first built, right? But that was a hundred years or so ago, not quite. But the there are some really important asymmetries. Uh, and back then, there was a central ownership model in place for the energy system. Uh, we live in a world today of a, a federated ownership model, 
And what's more, we'd come from a place where there were one or 200 power generators total across the whole country and a very down way one would stream, one, one directional stream for the use of, uh, of power and gas. Um, we're now, we already have millions of assets and back and forth multi-directional uh, use of the system. So you've got this federated ownership, federation of the assets. Those assets are themselves much more complex than the simple dials they used to operate on. So a lot of these are the drivers uh, for digitalization, but it also points to your comment that it's not as though Ofgem or the government are sat there, uh, you know, whatever your opinions may be on public or private ownership, in central ownership, someone has the mandate to make decisions. We all really do need to work in partnership because, because no one entity has ownership or responsibility for the energy system that we share among us today. So Ofgem, yes, plays a role in that. I'm not even sure I would call it first among them, but yet we do have a, a certain USP of being able to convene and help coordinate. And given that federated ownership, it is critical that we do just that. And that's been the thrust of a lot of our work to date, and I'm sure it will continue to be so. Uh, we've taken a multi-pronged approach about uh, ensuring leadership and communication. Even opportunities like this are, are small tidbits, opportunities to help raise awareness. Uh, but we've also backed up the leadership and expectations from things like our energy data task force work, um, but to, um, to also move into like regulations and make sure that it's not just uh, hot air, but they're actually doing it. And we're at the point now where we do have regulations that are taking shape around expectations on the use of data and how digital services need to be delivered. And naturally, given the type of work that it is, uh, they leave room for flexibility. We need markets to be able to fill the gaps for themselves and in general deal with the uncertainty that comes with data assets and digital service assets, which have much shorter life cycles than the physical infrastructure we've grown accustomed to in the past. So we have been doing certainly those two things of giving clear direction, convening people and creating open conversations so that a shared vision for the future can be arrived at for the shared energy system. We are updating our regulatory rules, demanding things like treating the data as presumed open to create that right to roam that I referred to earlier. Uh, and on top of that, we've also been working with wider parts of government to stimulate uh, new types of services. Because when, when a sector transforms like this, one that has many monopolies in it, there is a reasonable chance, and we think we see them, that new types of uh, monopolies might be required for the modern energy system. For example, the the agreements and practices for how we interoperate data between our traditional monopolies is itself ironically a monopolistic service uh, and so there are there are new types of regulatory challenge um, so so we've had this this breadth across direction coordination uh, backing it up with governance and stimulating new services allowing them to come forward where market forces don't allow okay let me just move over to Paul. Paul, you're that person who has to respond to the regulatory requirement with your license renewal in 2023. Surely this is going to have a huge impact on the competencies that are required within your organization, both in IT and, and the, the business as a whole. How are you going to deal with that big shift in the competency of the organization? Yeah, it's a great point, Peter, and, and you're absolutely right. There are there are competencies that we have to build from scratch. There are some that we need to um, scale up. Some that we probably need to scale down. You know, things that that are no longer the, the most important things that need we need to be work, working on. Excuse me. Um, but yeah, I suppose the, the way that we're addressing this is is similar to what I described before. You know, agile in more than just the project sense. You know, we, we need to be better at, at taking little and and small, but many of them steps toward these these future goals. So, you know, we 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 see that embracing the open energy uh, agenda uh, underpinned by data and digitalization, it it will change our business in both the IT and the core business perspective. And, and in particular, the areas where we're trying to focus are in that people and culture space and how we will, in particular, attract and retain new talent that, that supports this digital journey uh, and data skills, whilst retraining our current colleagues to operate in that new world as well. Because, you know, we're talking about delivering 
you know, data at the point of need for, for our internal colleagues as well as our, our, our external stakeholders. So, you know, we, we're, we're being very uh, focused on making sure whilst we are on this open uh, agenda, we're not forgetting our internal colleagues and, and making sure that they have what they need as well. So I think that in itself means that we are looking at different delivery models and approaches to that delivery as well. Um, so, you know, as I said, we're starting that journey on, on embracing the agile ways across the whole enterprise as opposed to just the, the project space, um, which is a mind shift uh, from the current model. Um, and, and I suppose what, we need, what we're trying to do is embrace the change um, in the full knowledge that some of these parts and, and processes mm -hmm. will fail, but but that's mm -hmm. acceptable, and and that mm -hmm. you know that is just where where we need to get to, and then that that final piece where we see um, that that change in approach is is in the customer centricity, where you know um, I, I suppose to Stephen Stephen's points earlier around uh, you know the the asset um, space that probably was where we centered our our focus particularly in the data space. Whereas what we're trying to do now is see it much more from a, a customer perspective. So change that focus from asset centricity to customer centricity. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, I think what I would say is the, the, the collaboration both across the sector through the, uh, the NG Networks Association, but also with Ofgem and the guidance that they're putting out and the way that that, that, that is a, a collaborative backwards and forwards. So, you know, I've, I've had a lot of opportunities to spend some time with, with Stephen and his team and the development of our digitalization strategy. These are, these are really helpful steps for us in terms of making sure that we are learning as a, as a whole, as opposed to in this, this individualistic way, because whilst we all start from different places, we all are finding very mm -hmm. similar problems uh, and making sure that we are uh, addressing these problems in the in the right way across the sector, I think it's mm -hmm. it's better to be doing now than trying to retrofit this further down the line. It it, it I I picked up there on your use of the word a mindset change, and I know that's something Stephen has been talking about on social media that this really does take a mindset change. Um, I'm very interested to hear Johnny's perspective. Um, Johnny, you mentioned earlier in the conversation that that it was perhaps a two-year startup to get people's minds around this, what it was actually meeting, what, what it was actually needing to happen. How, how did you prepare? What were your early steps in this process? How could, what advice could you give the energy sector to shortcut some of that early days? Okay, yeah. Um, just actually to pick up on Stephen's point and give, I guess, people a bit of reassurance in terms of, how the models work for open banking. So when he talks about, um, you know, a monopoly is required to create interoperability between other monopolies, that's actually quite analogous with how the open banking piece is played out. We have the concept of um, an open banking implementation entity. Um, crucially, they're designed to bring all participants and the ecosystem together to try and drive the agenda forward, make decisions, set standards, etc. I think the, the big difference with something like that, and, and it's an important one, is that it's not just a committee of people that are you know, debating the academics of how we should do this. They're actually um, driving conversations to conclusion uh, and making decisions in order to move the whole ecosystem forward. But yeah, I mean, to your question, Peter, you know, how, how did we prepare? So um, from an open banking perspective, um, you know, I think it's fair to say that 2015 and 2016, the, the number of people that even knew what those terms were was, was very small. As a technology organization, we didn't really hear the terms until late 2016, 2017, when we were starting to get, to get out of them. So a lot of the early conversa conversations were driven, you know, in the architecture space by policymakers, by people that were slightly disconnected from delivery. So I guess my first um, piece of advice would be, you know, evangelize this stuff in the organization, you know, let people know that it's on the horizon and, it, and it's coming and they need to, to start to prepare for it. In terms of how we as a banking sector um, went about this, uh, and to be honest with you, I, I'm someone that has a belief that, you know, most human beings look like most other human beings and most big corporates look like most other big corporates, right? I don't, I don't think that sector always has a, a massive change in terms of how people operate. So I suspect um, the challenges will be, will be similar for the energy sector. 
The first thing that we as a sector did was we set ourselves some simple goals. And I think that speaks well to, to kind of Paul's points. The first simple goal that we set was, can we deliver um, a set of customer agnostic um, static data APIs that would let people um, you know, see some really, frankly, naughty things, some, some rather uninteresting things? But I think crucially what that did was it, it proved the ecosystem model. So could people collaborate to come up with open specifications that we could all buy into for a seemingly simple deliverable? Could the what's called the CMA9 um, in the banking sector, i.e. the nine biggest banks in the UK, actually even deliver something that was perceived to be very simple in a very short period of time? So kind of getting out the starting blocks with something that was simple, that did kind of get the wheels greased and allowed people to, to deliver quickly, I think, I think was quite important. Um, again, to set the scene, uh, and I'm sure some people will be aware of the, the kind of, of NatWest, but NatWest as a bank, you know, we have multiple brands that make up NatWest, uh, and across those brands, we serve multiple customer segments. So we deal with everyone from Johnny with a current account and a mortgage, through to the biggest companies in the UK, through to ultra high net worth individuals, right? Um, and all these, all these people, unsurprisingly, are served by disconnected systems in the bank, um, as you know, many many big corporates have, right? Acquisitions or the way that we've built stuff has tended to mean that we don't have one technology stack that that fits all. So what we did um, at the start was really we had to go out into the bank and find um, the right. SMEs, key people that could short circuit a lot of the conversations that we were about to step into. Um, again, to Paul's point, we knew that if we behaved in this, the way that we we always behave or we, we've tended to behave, then there's probably a high chance of, of, of failure, right? Um, which is elongated timelines, missing the the deadlines that that we're being we're being set. Um, and I think I think we needed a bit of that right-sided pressure from the regulator, if I'm being honest. You know, the, the ecosystem has to rely on things. The ecosystem can't wait forever for a participant to deliver its, its part of value. So, you know, it spurs us to deliver great APIs for people to consume. And equally, the ecosystem finds and nurtures potential prospects that would want to consume these things, right? So from both ends, you've got a bit of um, positive pushing push and pull there. Um, as we set ourselves up, one of the things that we did was we tried to, where possible, um, make the teams as autonomous as they could possibly be. So bring people together that could deliver uh, APIs from top of the API, either the thing that's consumed, down to the back of the underlying um, source system. That in itself, to some extent, presented us with lots of opportunities to solve problems in ways that that we wouldn't have solved them in ways before. So, uh, you know, an example is, you know, how do we throttle traffic into our, you know, seemingly old systems? Well, actually, if we've got if we've got an API from front to back, we could throttle that traffic at the top, and then save a bunch of people way down in the depths of the the bank's core mainframe type systems from having to, you know, implement lots of layers of of extra connectivity there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we delivered uh, our first set of more complex APIs in, in 2018, where we could tap into customer data. Um, so it was a short timeline. Uh, you know, we went from static APIs in Q1 of 2017 to APIs that people would really base, you know, valuable propositions on in January 2018. I think that, um, that, uh, that timeline was actually quite beneficial for us. You know, again, I'm a believer that, um, and I know there's a, there's a law that, that that you can call it, but as soon as you set a date on the right, people will tend to fill the space in between now and that mm -hmm. date. No matter what you do, you find yourself at eight o'clock the night before trying to to get the last piece of the jigsaw into place. So actually, you know, I'd I'd, I'd encourage people to to inject a bit of tension and urgency into the problem there, and because I think it's the the quickest way to really mm -hmm. drive towards the the outcome. That will feel uncomfortable. Okay. You know, it will mm -hmm. make people feel a bit uneasy. I think it's important in order to to get them to to move quickly, and then the last thing I'd I'd probably say is um, 
I think you should probably appreciate that you're you're really going to be tackling two problems here. One is you're trying to deliver modern standards, modern ways of getting data to consumers, maybe API patterns, connectivity patterns, security patterns, etc. And on the other hand, you're going to have to figure out how to connect the bank in ways that you might not have connected them before. So, you know, how do you tie the thread between four or five different systems that have never really spoken to one another? So making sure that you've got the skills in those teams that recognize, you know, both you've got to negotiate modern technologies, a modern ecosystem, but you've also got to um, tie together the, the nuts and bolts of the bank, people that understand how to have those conversations and frankly navigate complexity would be, mm. would be uh, important to, to success. Okay. It, 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 it strikes me, you know, once when you were talking about 2018, by, by the time you've built up a head of steam and the, the genie is out of the bottle and you're on a journey, which is probably irreversible at that stage. Um, and, and, and things are picking up momentum. Um, if we're just, just thinking about now how we would manage this transition, and I'm going to come back to Stephen with a question here. Um, Stephen, you, once, once the genie is out of the bottle here, it's not going back. And the level of change which is coming, I don't think anybody really understands or expects it to be what it will probably end up being. As a regulator... Are you concerned that you're ready for this? Could this level of change be quicker, faster, and bigger than the regulator? What What is the regulator doing to stay at pace with this change? It, yeah, lovely, Peter. Um, very important. Um, the, I, th I think at the, the the real macro level, the um, uh, the the challenges of changing technology are are changing what good governance looks like, and I mean that in a very big and broad and generalised sense. And 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 somewhat you can point to the fact that the act of our own government at large, not just Ofgem, has that problem all over its portfolio of governance. Uh, that that the way the world optimally operates is starting to look very different to the one that we've traditionally known. And, that's actually quite akin to the challenge that, is the, 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 for example, Paul's been talking about with these, you know, the, we, we've asked network companies to publish their strategies. And here we are having to think about our own work. And, 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 and if, if, I, if I get crude for a moment, I th there is a really important lesson here for Ofgem to eat its own dog food, uh, to, that we need to have our own plan for digitalization you know what if we allow or, or not allow so much but unblock and enable the energy sector to digitalize and we don't do anything ourselves how are we reasonably expecting to be able to govern that so yes absolutely that change and modernization is in our is in our plans and there are some really actually aside from the challenges of overcoming that and we are investing in in continuing to improve our own competencies and abilities, but there's some really found foundationally interesting opportunities around how effective governance take place, about what new and modern markets look like. Um, as you have much easier and ready access and opportunities for the use of data, uh, you, you can start in increasingly enabling those around you to participate in the act of regulation as well as conducting more advanced regulation yourself. So you have this choice between the regulator being an increasingly advanced processing factory of information to make effective policy decisions. But at the same time, you have an increasing opportunity for digital services to enable everyone around the regulator to have their say and participate for themselves in what they think effective governance looks like. And of course, some of the practical avenues for this are things like the digitization of uh, governing codes and licenses and information, uh, but also other sides of things that I think are really important and where a lot of new markets could arise actually is around, uh, if you like, the data pipeline is the common language in, 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 the, in the sector, but the end-to-end the the -end processing of the data, not just the raw data itself, the starting asset, but all of the, the, the changes and modifications and, and uh, edits that you make to it through all your software mm. scripts and such to get to your endpoint. That whole process is itself a wonderfully interesting and complex supply chain, and one in which, uh, certainly when it comes to policymaking, is, is our bread and butter. We're, you know, we pull in information and we make decisions, yeah. that's all we do. Actually looks quite like a system operator in that regard, which I think is an interesting analogy. 
Um, so with organizations like that, where, you know, the irony is, of course, Ofgem itself is one of these monopolies I've talked about. We don't participate in the physical energy system, but we absolutely are an actor in the digital energy system because people need regulatory information to make effective business mm. decisions. And so actually there are, there, there are, you know, the detailed level of how we improve our own infrastructure and make better use of data. But there's also some really fascinating uh, regulatory business model questions about uh, where are the opportunities to allow other people to literally take digitized mm -hmm. regulatory information, uh, put it into their, their own uh, business models, crank the handle, determine where regulation is blocking, say, innovation, new projects, and be able to have the industry or prospective industry sort of self-raise proposed modifications. Hey, look, you know, we can crowdsource mm -hmm. the regulatory expectations and say, we think you should think about this, Ofgem. And then you're, what you're doing is, in, is you're minimizing the size of that natural regulatory monopoly uh, mm -hmm. and maximizing the opportunity for markets to bring forward recommendations and decisions which of course still need a, you know, some degree of oversight and you have to manage incentives and all that sort of thing but this mm -hmm. is just a modernization you know we've all gotten used to this through say websites you go back 30 years if you wanted to know about regulation you had to go pick it up from your library now you can just pop online which is really enabling for people to understand and participate Technology is allowing a continuation of that, and absolutely, it applies to the regulator as much as it does to any other market. Yeah. It, it seems like nobody is untouched from this level of change, whether it be the market itself, the actors in this market, the regulator, um, and and also the, the broader, I would say, equity in the market. And, and the morning of the recording of this session, We've seen a number of announcements in the press in relation to the national grid and distribution. Um, so there are already moves afoot. I'll, I'll come to you, Paul. Um, the journey that you are going to go on, how are you planning to use this whole en open energy initiative? And, and one area I think is a really good example is currently Northern Power Grid is a, a distribution network operator of a time where infrastructure was a fit and forget type investment. And now you're moving very much to a services organization um, where the, it, it is, it, you know, fit, fit is only the first start in that process. How are you using open energy to change the size and shape and, and the very essence of what Northern Power Grid is all about? Yeah, it, 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 you're absolutely right. And it goes to the heart of our, our digitalization strategy and, and, and wider the business plan for, for AD2, where you know, we're, we're building a program to embrace data and digitalization and the presumed open culture by embracing digital platforms that will position us to be able to make that move from DNO to DSO. Um, and and we, we recognize that it will kind of shift the balance from these things being um, not afterthoughts, but, but, you know, as you said, you know, fit and forget will be a thing of the past because for every fit that you would do, there is that aspect of what is the wider service aspect? What is the data as products and services go along with this and how does that feed into our wider market? So, you know, our, our vision for data is to, is to have empowered people, not just internally, externally as well, informed by that data. And the approach um, to be uh, then underpinned through functions such as the Digital Transformation Office, which is one of the things that we're looking to implement as part of that um, enabling capability as we approach AD2. Because I suppose to, to, to Johnny's point earlier on around um, uh, avoiding the sort of program approach to this change, I mm -hmm. think is going to be key. You know, we want to avoid that sort of siloed aspect as much as possible in a key sort of lesson learned from some of the, the things that have gone on in the financial sector is that we want to try and have that, that transition embedded into the whole business as opposed to being led by any one specific area. And, and you know, typically it will, be, uh, it will be IT that will lead off on this. But I think the one thing that our, our natural regulatory periods, periods offer us is that opportunity to embed it in that plan and that's certainly what we're doing at the moment is, mm. uh, you know, we're, we're not having sort of a, a separate digitalization strategy that, that has no correlation to the plan. The plan is, is embedded in the digitalization strategy and vice versa. So, 
you know, we are, I think, afforded the opportunity to set out with the right intentions in play. Mm. And I think having such a long lead time into our next regulatory period and, and the, the guidance that's, that's coming out right now and, and the work that was pre um, done around uh, with the EDTF report that, that has all sort of started us on this journey, I think is, is the, it certainly feels like the right thing to be doing in our sense. And overall, I think our, our, um, our IS team will drive and enable that transformation, but it's essential that the overall program is owned and embraced across that, the whole business. This is a systemic change. It's yeah. not an add-on. It is absolutely changing everything around it. I'm going to bring this last question to Johnny, who absolutely has the benefit of hindsight, and I'm very interested in his opinions on what next. Um, so, Johnny, you you have the luxury of being able to look back over the last five years and reflect on what are the one or two key things that changed in IT and the NatWest group. And very interested in your forward-looking perspective. So what is next for open banking? Where do you think that will go next? Yeah, um, so I guess on the first the first half of that question, I touched on it uh, briefly before. So, you know, we were an organization and, you know, we still have pockets of it um, that depended on project management, Gantt charts, priority calls, you know, the stitching together of fairly complex networks of dependencies to actually realize value. You know, the, the real transition and it's tangible and touchable now is that, you know, we talk about being a connected bank inside inside the bank um, and that kind of comes across and how people interact with one another now. So it's not about uh, getting into people's backlogs or, you know, figuring out how to get access to some bespoke piece of data. And so what, what are the APIs that you've got? Um, you know, how, how can I consume them as quickly as possible? If I do need a, a new feature or a, you know something added, it's no longer about trying to figure out how to add that as a bespoke add-on to you know some system. It's a how do I surface this in the API such that not only my proposition can get the benefit of it, but actually the the entire um, ecosystem can benefit from it as well. Can benefit from it as well. Um, and I think you know to Paul's point, the, the future for us is open banking started as a term. You know, using the old adage, you know, capital, capital B, a, a mandatory word that we all had to implement. You know, open banking is now for us, uh, you know, the platform that, that we build stuff off inside the bank. It's, you know, how we surface data to consumers. It's not about mandatory delivery of things anymore. It's about going well beyond that and opening up um you know, access to all sorts of other data so that we can continue to benefit from the, the great ideas that have been generated externally uh, and internally from that data. Um, two things I'll, I'll guess I'll leave us on. One, um, so we have now integrated with something like 200 financial services institutions. As I say, these are institutions who have missions to improve customer lives and, and give them great experiences to manage their financial lives. In the pipeline, um, you know, there's probably double that, if, if not more, of institutions that are in the funnel, uh, either going through ideation or licensing to, to manage people's money that will bring even more value to this ecosystem. So from a participation, a participation and a you know, do we grow at roughly the same rate or actually do we pick up pace? You know, the only way from my, from my perspective anyway is, is up from here. I expect us to continue to, to grow at an exponential rate for the, the coming years. Uh, and the only other thing um, is we do have other kind of, I guess, add-ons to what open banking was. People will start to hear terms like open finance, for example, um, which is the kind of next, the next step to open banking, i.e., you know, how do we go on how do we go beyond the, the products and bits of data and the customer bases that we've delivered for today and move further into things like, you know, loans, investments, pensions, insurance, et cetera, et cetera. And that will have a broader impact for, for you know, wider than just the financial services sector. 
I think the, the great thing about that is, you know, as these ecosystems continue to kind of emerge and grow um, almost in isolation to some extent, actually we'll start to see the overlap of them quite a bit. Mm. Uh, we've seen some examples of that in various hackathons and uh, kind of propositions that are starting to come to market. You know, how do you use your your financial data to better plan your, your energy use? You know, how can you become a more carbon conscious human being, et cetera? You know, I think the thing that really excites me in the, the next two, three years is, you know, as the energy sector moves more into making this data available for consumption or free consumption by by uh, the entities that are part of the ecosystem, actually those things can start to be stitched together um, and ultimately we can realise, uh, you know, great customer value, but, but actually, you know, you know, wider benefit to the broader climate agenda that I think is front and centre of everyone's everyone's minds at the minute. You know, how do we double down on that and and uh, and go go further faster? Um, yeah, so an exciting time for us. You know, it's something that uh, has kept me excited and hungry to turn up to work every day for the last three four years. Um, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon for us either. So I'm I'm looking forward to continuing to to grow the ecosystem and, and see lots of different yeah. people succeed as that I'm, goes. I mean, um, I mean, that's fantastic insight. And, and I, I also take away from that, the future is open, absolutely open, regardless of which sector you sit in. Um, so I, for, let me just say thank you very much to all of that insight from our, from our guests. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand back over to Claire um, to field any of the questions that have come in from our audience. Claire, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Peter. And yeah, thank you to all of the panellists for that really fascinating discussion. We're going to get to the Q&A in just a second. I can see some questions that have already come in, but I did mention at the start that we had a short survey. We're really interested to hear what you thought of today's discussion, but also this topic in general. It's a one minute survey and we're going to donate five pounds for every completed survey to the Altitude Foundation. Now, if you haven't heard of them, the Altitude Foundation is a really amazing charity that supports disadvantaged young people who have a passion for technology into their first uh, job within digital. So I've put the link for the survey in the chat box and you should also have it in your email. Now let's get straight to the questions if everybody's ready. Now the first question I've got here, it doesn't say who it's for, it says data integ integrity and validation is key in any energy system. To reach net zero, real-time data will be necessary to balance supply and demand, which brings its own challenges. In this open energy model, what entity do you envision will be the source of truth to ensure this integrity? I mean, I, I don't know if you want to say something as well, Paul, but I could have a punt at this one. Um, yeah, go on, you start. I mean, so this is, a, I think, a nice... Uh, more grounded real example of what I was making as a more theoretical point earlier about breaking down of supply chains uh, of, of data insight. Um, so there's, a, when it comes to single source of truth, there's something that makes sense at the very start of the supply chain, just about surfacing the data in the first instance before you do anything to it, where the information will be mostly guided by just literal physics about, about the nature of, of what's happening on the energy system. But depending on the, the kind of source of truth or the validity of the data, well, that will hinge a great deal on what the current application of that data is. So that gets you into all the processing, which is why I drew that out earlier. And actually, there's quite a mixed bag of options here that I don't think there'll just be one solution for everything. I, I, I'm optimistic that when we talk about new digital markets in the general sense, this is an expression of one such thing where actually, if the basic data is available to everybody, then you're creating space for business models to come forward, whose very job it is, is to validate the use and applications of information and allow markets to solve the problem. There may well be instances where there are fairly high barriers to those market forces, maybe a high reliance on the tacit knowledge that, that an organization that produces the data uh, might have, where it's just not practical to let market forces run forwards. And in, that, in those cases, then, sure, you might need to start picking out entities which either directly have accountability for that work or where you might find that there's more mediating entities that have a kind of recognized independence. 
but I don't think it's a single answer question, but I do think it's a really interesting insight into the opportunities for new types of jobs that people might do that we're not accustomed to them doing uh, in the world that we've come from. Yeah, and, and Stephen, all, all I was going to add to that is, is that I, in agreement that I think the, the kind of the, the single source of truth is probably um, is not a viable way to look at it, uh, to, to your point. But I, I think there is something around that, um, that necessity to have an agreement about almost what the truth is. So almost the, the, the standardization, the, the collaboration around what the metadata or the, the description of the data is, I think, more, more accurate as something that will need to be, again, probably regulator led in terms of bringing forth the conversation. But certainly what I'm seeing at the moment is a, is a degree of collaboration around that exact thing. And, and I think that's, that's part of the answer to the, the question as well. Great stuff. And I've got one, I think, for you here, Johnny. It says, how much did the potential cons consumers of data get involved and help shape the way open banking was defined and developed? Are there any lessons that can be learned from the implementation of open energy from this? Yeah, good question. So um, open banking at its core had this thing called the Open Banking Implementation Entity. Um, that was a body uh, empowered by the Competition and Markets Authority to move the open banking agenda forward uh, with the CMA9. Um, as part of that implementation entity, they ran various kind of working groups, technical design authorities, you know, steering committees, etc., uh, to try and come to the, the answers that the, the ecosystem needed. And some of those working groups would have been things like um, specification working groups, so, you know, as a, as a producer of data, what data can you give to market? As a consumer of data, what, consumer of, what, what data do you need to build useful propositions for the market? And then the arbiter of those conversations was the implementation entity. So they brought those people together, you know, worked through the reality of delivery and figuring out what, what was possible was it possible to get the same data across all providers of the data or actually were some providers just not able to, to provide it? Um, those, the outcomes of those discussions and those working groups were published as specifications, which the banks then had to, uh, to deliver against. So the, the, I guess the short answer is they had a high, a high degree of um, participation in that process. Um, you know, I think if you ask the, the producers of of the data to come up with what they want to give you in isolation. It doesn't create the right amount of, um, you know, friction and tension in the, the ecosystem in order to get the right, the right things from them. So yeah, they were, were highly involved in the process and, and still are today actually. Great stuff. And I've got one for you, Stephen here. It's quite a long question, so buckle in. <laughs> it says, why do regulations salami slice industries? Connecting renewables to grids via large-scale, long-duration inertial storage will save grids billions capital and operational costs, while also making renewable energy cheaper. But grids are banned from investing. Ofto regulations prevent offshore wind investing. Salami slicing revenue streams with short-duration, short-lead-time contracts prevents private investment. When will this change so that the energy transition can be affordable, reliable, and resilient? Okay. Yes, that is a lot to take in. Um, <laughs> I think that's, but I think that's kind of um, uh, it's it's nice actually. So this is an uh, actually getting to some of the point I was answering a few minutes ago, um, where there's someone who's clearly got an awful lot of thoughts about a particular topic, and not one I can reasonably fully answer because there's a lot to it uh, on the fly. But part of the point that would, I was trying to get at earlier about the business model of regulation is it actually, in, in, you know, in, in, and largely driven by historical technology opportunities, it is quite hard for people to have the level engagement that at times they often want in the energy sector. If someone's formed a view where they see weaknesses in, in how regulations carried out, they might, they might be dead right. They, they might not realize other factors that are uh, outside of their world, world view, because um, none of us can be on top of the whole system. I don't know, it might be right or wrong, but my point is, is that what, what's really valuable about this opportunity, the world at least that I know, 
is that by making data more available to people, by improving the types of digital services that are available, in this case about the regulator, rather than say in Paul's case about you know, the, the, the local network or the regional network, um, then we can make it easier for people to not just feel stifled and have these views, but actually make it practical to say, no, I, I'm not just asserting that I see these problems with your regulation, but actually here's the data Here's the basis that you made your decision on. I can be specific about what you did and what I think I would have explicitly done differently. And, and that democratization of participation in regulation is potentially very powerful because as, as with all monopolies, you don't, in, 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 you, they're a natural challenge, right? If an monopoly should exist, you've got a limited number of people who can participate in certain activities, but as much, you don't want to make that any bigger than it should be. So, and I think new technology data and digital work is, is is allowing for us to allow greater participation than was traditionally possible by allowing people to get more stuck into what we've got. But that requires us to keep changing as well, so that questions like that can get a much more constructive answer than I'd be able to give on the fly. Great stuff. Well, listen, and I'm very aware that we're almost out of time, but I want to end on one last question, which I think is for you, Paul. It says the automotive industry is committed to electric vehicle production. It's coming whether you're ready or not. What are you doing to support grid to vehicle and vehicle to grid services? Yeah, so uh, this is a, a big area for us and, and it does uh, feature as part of our DSO plan, uh, which is published on our site. And uh, unfortunately I don't, it, it's not my specific area, so I can't give you a very detailed answer other than signpost you to our website where we do have a, a fair amount of information on, on that specific thing. I think. You know, to, to some of the points I made earlier, we, we recognise a lot about a lot of this is around data and servicing data and making sure that we can um, provide that in real time, particularly in this in this um, use case, if you like, uh, being able to see where capacity is and, and where, for instance, vehicle charging points would be would be applicable is is a um, a fantastic use case for us being able to surface that data to the wider community and and help um, businesses plan that, help businesses be able to, um, you know, respond to market needs in that sense. Um, so apologies, it's not, it's not a great answer, but it, it's certainly from my perspective, that's where we fit in it. No, that's great. And that is all we've got time for today. So all that leaves me to say is thank you so much to all of our panelists today. We really appreciate you taking the time to come and, and speak to us all. And thank you to everyone who, uh, who dialed in today and who joined and to you, Peter, for facilitating the discussion. So uh, that's all from us. Hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and bye for now. <laughs>